Thank you all for coming tonight um, for this little stroll down memory lane, thinking about the early years of Southampton College, which many of us remember, who are old enough to remember. Um, my name is Penny Wright. I'm in charge of adult programs here at the library. And we would like to begin by thanking the Southampton Historical Museum, represented by Richard Behrens, who's seated in the back there for co-sponsoring this event with us and for their interest in oral history and in, in participating in quite a few programs with us. So thanks for that. Um, we're grateful to our own program staff, represented by Genevieve Linehan tonight in fact, a new, well actually she's been with us for a year, but we're very delighted to have her on our staff. So thank you, Genevieve. Um, of course, we're most grateful to our five guests uh, tonight, and I'll introduce them in a moment. But before I do, I would like to just say a quick word of thanks to Alice Glenn, who has been working for the college, I think, for 28 years, just just about the same amount of time as some of you here in this room, and who was very, very helpful to us in organizing materials and helping to get background information. So Alice, thank you very much. Yeah, we appreciate it. And before we begin, I'd also like to thank those of you who are not sitting up here, so many of you who should be up here. We might do a part two. Uh, it was really hard to sort of narrow it down, and um, so we, we might continue this. But I know that some of you have been here a very long time and uh, are very important members of the college faculty. So I want to acknowledge you, too, before we begin. So. Enough of that. I think we'll go ahead and get started, and I'll introduce you to five people who most of you probably know, and uh, you may recognize their photos in back of them. If that'll help. <laughs> no. you haven't no. seen them, if you haven't seen them in about 30 years, just take a look at back of where they're sitting. Uh, Chuck Hitchcock, seated to my left, is the interim dean of Southampton College, where he's been a faculty member for 35 years. Uh, he has served as director of the Social Science Division and, and is currently a professor of sociology. Prior to coming to Southampton College, he taught in the Peace Corps, and among the positions he has held during his tenure at Southampton College are director of special academic services, director of counseling, director of the Higher Education Opportunity Program. For 10 years, he was the head men's tennis coach and led the team to its first winning season ever. Chuck Hitchcock earned his AB degree in political science from Colgate University, his MS from NYU, and his PhD in sociology from Union Graduate School. For six years, he chaired the East Hampton Town Zoning Board of Appeals and has also chaired the board of directors of The Retreat. He is currently a member of the board of the Alternatives Counseling Center and in 1984, he ran for New York State Assembly. Please welcome Chuck Hitchcock. <laughs> to Chuck's left is uh, Ralph Welker, who we are very delighted to have here uh, with us this evening. Um, actually, I learned something about Ralph. Of course, I learned a lot about Ralph that I hadn't known, but I didn't know that he was born in Paris, in the American Hospital in Paris in a certain year. <laughs> and he's from Maine. Uh, he attended Oberlin College and then served in the United States Army. Um, at, for several years he was in the um, Medical Service Corps in Europe. Uh, in 1957 until 1961 he was on the biology faculty of the Northport <coughs> School on Long Island. He received, then went on to receive his uh, master's in biology at Hofstra and studied salt marsh ecology there and then attended the University of Washington in Seattle and in 1965 he worked for NASA, the Boeing Space Research Program. He was the crew biologist on a five-man, 30-day simulated space laboratory program. I didn't know that now. Well. That must have been interesting. <laughs> and from 1965 to 1993, he was a coordinator of the Marine Science
Science program at Southampton College. He is now Professor Emeritus of the Marine Science program. Uh, outside of his college responsibilities, Rao has served as a member of numerous, numerous boards and councils. He, has, he was a longtime trustee of the Nature Conservancy. He served on the New York State Attorney General's Wetlands Task Force, the Environmental Quality Council in Suffolk County, the Conservation Board in Southampton Town, and he's been active in Southampton Village environmental issues as well. It's a great pleasure to have you here, Rao. <laughs> Seated in the middle uh, is Harry Marmion, who I have to say was very helpful in planning this evening and was enthusiastic from when we first thought of it a couple of years ago. So Harry is one of the, the big reasons that we are, are doing this evening. So Harry, thanks for that. Uh, Harry was born and raised in Woodside, Queens, graduated from Fairfield University with a degree in social science and basketball. <laughs> uh, he received his law degree from Georgetown University after working as a financial analyst for the Securities and Exchange Commission. He worked as a lawyer at the Labor Department at the U.S. Coast Guard Academy in New London, as an administrator at Moorhead State University in Minnesota, Minnesota and worked in Washington, D.C. with the American Council on Education. In 1969, Harry Marmion became the first lay president of St. Xavier College in Chicago, or as he put it, the head nun. <laughs> in 1972, he moved to Southampton with his family to become the second president of Southampton College, remaining there until 1979. Since then, he has worked as vice president for academic affairs at Fairleigh Dickinson University. He has taught business law, management, and public administration, authored several books about the military draft system, served as the 43rd president of the United States Tennis Association, and has been very active in civic affairs. You see, his retirement did not slow him down, did it? <laughs> Please welcome Harry Marmion. <laughs> Bill Peterson, pre professor emeritus of English at Southampton College, began teaching at the college in 1967. He earned his A.B. and master's degrees at Brown University, his B. Lit from Oxford, and his Ph.D. from the University of Bristol. His graduate work, his research, and critical writing have focused on dramatic literature. He has also taught creative writing and continues to write poetry. Bill Peterson served as director of both the Fine Arts and the Humanities divisions at Southampton College. He was on the editorial board of Confrontation, the Long Island University magazine, and is currently a member of the committee for the Steinbeck Project. He is dramaturg for the Peccadillo Theater at the Bank Street Theater in New York City. Please welcome Bill Peterson. And bringing up the right-hand side of this line is John Strong. Another long-time, <laughs> another really long-time Southampton College faculty member. John is professor emeritus of history and the former director of the social science division at Southampton College, where he taught from 1964 to 1998. He's considered an authority and has on and has written extensively about Long Island's Algonquian peoples. His latest books are titled The Algonquian Peoples of Long Island from Earliest Times to 1700. The second book is We Are Still Here, The Algonquian Peoples of Long Island Today, and The Montaukett Indians of Eastern Long Island. In 1998, he was the recipient of a Fulbright Fellowship and spent a year in Hungary teaching about Native Americans. Dr. Strong has served as president of the Hampton Bay School Board and currently serves as president of the Suffolk County Archaeological Society. He's also on the board of the Sag Harbor Whaling Museum. Dr. Strong is currently at work on a history of Southampton College and on a monograph of Samson Oakham and the Brotherhood Indian Community from 1790 to 1830. Thank you very much, John, for being here. Please welcome John. I think what we decided to do was sort of 
touch on rather briefly the sort of background of the establishment of the college. And I asked John, who is interested in these things and working on, if he can talk to us just for a few minutes about the very beginnings, about the committee, et cetera. Can you do that, John? Sure. Uh, let me begin, though, by uh, pointing out that Don Baker is, uh, is here in the audience, and he was the man that hired me, and I've always admired his judgment. <laughs> so, and uh, so he really was one of the earliest, I think, that was here. And uh, uh, Danielle Gregory, who's doing some research now on the environmental history at Southampton. So if any of you who've been here were involved with environmental programs, she would like to, uh, to talk to you. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, well, in terms of the... Uh, the history of the college, there is a book that uh, was done in the history of Long Island University up until from the earliest times, earliest times again, from uh, <laughs> 26 to 68 in the last uh, four years, deal, he has a, a section on Southampton College, so if any of you are interested in, in the details, uh, you can look at the book, I won't repeat all of that information. But uh, at the beginning, in 1961 really, uh, there was a committee formed by local people I see uh, Mrs. Herrick here, her husband was involved with that project. And uh, uh, according to the, the, the book here, for some 20 years people in the area have been talking about the possibility of having a, a college here. Uh, in uh, 1961, uh, the uh, Suffolk County was growing rapidly. There had been a very successful uh, uh, expansion of Long Island University to CW Post. And so uh, it seemed that the time was right. The committee uh, got together, uh, Art Hall and uh, a number of other businessmen, as mentioned, uh, Harry, is that okay? Yes, yeah, uh, And uh, approached the uh, people at Long Island University and managed to, uh, to come up with the money to, to purchase the old Tucker Mill, which was the earlier, the, the Clayton Estate. And uh, that was the beginning of the college. The first class came in in 1963. Uh, with uh, 12 faculty and uh, 313 students. Uh, they were housed mainly in the existing buildings <laughs> there, uh, on, on campus, and then the next year the, uh, the buildings were, were uh, uh, constructed and the, uh, the college was, uh, was off and running. Uh, I don't know if you, do you want John, to go? Yeah, I want to ask you, was the, college, was the formation an idea that ge was generated here by this committee? Let's hear who was on the committee, too. That would be kind it was of our hall and uh, Herrick's uh, husband, Sam Herrick. Sam Herrick. Uh, and, uh, those, uh, and then they, they got the local uh, elected leaders and the towns and so forth came on to this. But as I said, this was something that had been going on for some time here. Uh, and I think the businessmen saw the possibility here of all of these uh, consumers. Uh, coming out here, and, and but I think there were also people who felt that the college would be good for the uh, for the town. And so forth. there were some who didn't. There were some who were scared to death uh, about the college uh, coming out here. Some who thought that some still oh, are, particularly <laughs> in the sixties. What's that? Some still are. Some still are. Right. Uh, and there were some who felt you know this is going to be the barbarian invasion. You know, uh, with all these students, particularly when you're talking about. Uh, uh, 62, 63, and, uh, and so on. And of course there were some activities at the college that reinforced all those fears, <laughs> as you can imagine. Yeah. Okay, good. So it was established with a fairly small student body then. Yes. 300 something. Yes. As a, and, and what is it today? It's about a thousand, I think. Chuck okay. can tell you better. Right? Okay. It's about 1,100. 1,100. Right. And it's, it's fluctuated during the uh, the Vietnam years, of course, the population of the college went up because the people wanted to avoid the draft. And they went up to, I think, 1,400 or more at, at one point. And uh, then uh, it, it, it dropped back, okay. but it's, it's, it's sort of plateaued around 900 to 1,100, I think, uh, ever since. Okay. Um, just for the record, even though many of you are very familiar with Southampton College, Harry, could you just touch on a minute just the relationship between LIU and Southampton, just the structure of, uh, in two minutes or less? It's a very complicated relationship. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's always harmonious, right? When I arrived in 1972, it was really called the Southampton Center of Long Island University. And I maintain that centers don't give degrees, colleges do. 
and so I kept changing the name to Southampton College on the front of the, of the uh -huh. I kept changed back. Now it is safely said to be Southampton College. One of the problems is that uh, people out here in Southampton wanted the college to be here so their own children could be educated close to home. Another reason for, for people wanting the college was because in the winter time they have revenues. Well, the problem was that Southampton began to price its tuition higher than, than, than necessary because there was no endowment. So every time something happened, we had, to, we had to raise the tuition to cover the expenses. Not a good way to get off to a, to a start for a fine school. But however, within all of Long Island University, there are three academic majors. All three reside at Southampton. The rest of the, what happens at LIU up the island, is no concern of ours. We've got the good academic program. We always have had. Thank you. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, could we talk a little bit, just name names and just acknowledge some people who have worked at the college for a very long time? Uh, maybe some of them are in this room, but I've heard so many names that I'd like to just go over them a little bit. Um, um, <coughs> Well, I see somebody right there, Joan Zimmer. Vivian Dillon, Jane Strong, right. Tom Harrison, Betty Skinner, Larry Little. Okay. Mary Toppy is in back. Uh, George Hiltner. Mary Peterson. George Hiltner. Who's Mary George Hiltner? There's George. There's George. And then Don Baker there. Um, Carol Gilbert, did you mention Carol? There she is. Well, then there's Alice Glenn again. Raymond is here. Where's yeah, Raymond's recognition to go? Okay. Great. Um, let me ask you all, or whoever would like to comment on this, just what was it like teaching at a really a pretty brand new school? Now, which of you was the earliest here? I'm trying to think. Then. Would it have been you, Bill? No, I think I was. Was it John? Five, yeah. um, what what was it? I mean, it was basically relatively new when everyone except for Harry, Harry came a few years later. But what was it like for you? Was it your first university teaching job? It was my first full-time university job. And what what was it like in those early, early years? You had very few students. Were well, the first, by the time I came, I think down about the second year, the enrollment had gone up considerably from 300, I think. It was moving up there quite, quite rapidly. But uh, it was a very... Uh, well, it was an exciting time in term, politically, but it was also exciting in terms of the kind of curriculum that uh, Don and uh, Ed Glantz and others had developed, which was uh, a focus on the core, uh, interdisciplinary core, which, interestingly enough, we just had a three-day retreat at the college and they want to, uh, <coughs> to develop a core program again. Uh -huh. Going back to, to that, uh, with, with obviously uh, with, with different kinds of uh, uh, concerns and, and, and structures. But a lot of a lot of similarities there. But uh, it was, uh, yeah. You know, again, any, any any first job is always kind of right. uh, kind of exciting. Did it feel like sort of an institution that was just feeling its way? I mean, was there a sense, was <laughs> yes, it exciting it in that sense that it was such a new uh, institution? Uh, I, I think so. And uh, uh, Professor Baker, Don Baker, was interested in pushing to have a multicultural, international focus. And uh, I was at Syracuse University at the time working in the Peace Corps program there, and Donald had been a, in the Peace Corps mm -hmm. and had um, was, was one of the uh, um, observers and so forth, or, or evaluators, I guess, of Peace Corps programs from Washington. And he was the one that recruited uh, several of us to come down mm -hmm. because he wanted to uh, develop that kind of uh, of approach mm -hmm. and uh, to be involved with the outside uh, world in direct ways, the civil rights and uh, problems of poverty and uh, uh, and the third world. So, mm -hmm. backtracking just a little bit, um, for those of you who came to town in the earliest years, did you feel welcome in this community? Oh, yes. oh, Pretty yes. much so, or I had a interesting experience. Um, I guess it would have been New Year's Eve of 1968. Mm -hmm. um, I was renting on a piece of property that was between two homes uh, owned by members of the same family, business people, and about five of midnight I got a phone call and uh, they inquired as to whether 
I was up there by myself, and I said I was, and uh, they insisted that I come down for the celebration of New Year's, so I waited till after New Year's and then went down. It was one of those occasions where everybody had been drinking a bit, so uh, they were certainly freaked with what they were talking about, and no one knew me, and so I walked in and I discovered that I had several subversive colleagues on the faculty from their perspective. This was shortly after there had been a march down <laughs> Job's Lane, and I discovered that John and Jane Strong and Barbara Cook and Don Baker were all subversive because they wanted to unite the Shinnecock Nation and the African American population and up upend the, the merchant class in South Harbor. We did our best. Yeah. That was my introduction, and I thought, oh, this is interesting. <laughs> Did you, um, were there, how did you meet people in this village? I mean, was it through church or through, I mean, did people come and audit your classes or how did you get integrated into the, into Southampton life? Well, I joined the Rotary. You joined the Rotary? The Rotary and uh, met Reverend Falmouth, who was a Marine in World War II and assumed since I was a Marine in Korea, that I was in favor of the war. <coughs> and when he found out that I wasn't, he had a rather bristly relationship. <laughs> How about you, Bill? My wife and I did it the old-fashioned way. Through her family, we had a few connections and met some people in the social world in Southampton. Some of them were wonderful people. Alice Duddington was head of the museum and a vigorous, uh, powerful woman. And Mary Chester Dale's husband was a great art yeah. collector. But there were others who regarded the college as an intrusion, likely to introduce great numbers of cat burglars so they could sell their jewelry. There were others who spoke <laughs> with great alarm about marches, I think, on the Presbyterian church. Yes. <laughs> and okay. remarks were made that were racist and sexist and reactionary, in my opinion, so that it was sometimes hard to keep one's mouth shut. Yeah. My, my interaction was with a different segment entirely because I started uh, a tutoring program on the Shinnecock Reservation, and uh, one of the first uh, organizations that we developed out of that was a, a group that we called SCORE, Southampton Congress of Racial uh, Equality. And of course, the name was close enough to CORE to scare the hell out of everybody. <laughs> and uh, so I, we had interactions with uh, the Native American community and with the African American community, and we did indeed uh, march on, on uh, Southampton, and we did indeed raise the question of, of this, this segregated hour on Sunday morning in the churches, mm -hmm. and we had a parade that went down through town and, and ended at the, uh, uh, what's, no, not the, the windmill. At the, no, we ended at the, at the store, the, the grocery store in town. Was the, the, Bohacks? Uh, yeah, Bohacks. Yeah. John, was the, you know, the political activism, what, were you sort of the instigator, or was it your Well, story? that's what everybody said. <laughs> I have to tell you that I wasn't here more than two months, and John had me on a picket line in front of Bohacks. <laughs> we, were, we were picketing for grapes, as I remember. <laughs> and uh, for, the, for the farm workers, and uh, yeah, we were off and running after that. Yeah, that was the first march down to the town. It was a little shock to everybody because a lot of uh, African Americans from Amityville and other places came with their dashikis on, and the people in Southampton seeing this, you know, because quote their blacks were not like that. They didn't think, and there's what's going on here. You know, we're in real trouble. But yeah, that was. Were the, these events covered in the papers? Yes, I imagine yes. so. John, well, didn't you have a couple of little? Flyers from the, the paper about uh, that you showed me before. <coughs> in the, maybe it was a school newspaper. Yeah, I have several of them here. Uh, some of them are X-rated, <laughs> but uh, they were. Uh, you mean you mean photographs of the? Well, there was uh, a little cartoon of. Oh yes, yes, you know, yes. Someone. The cartoon in the windmill, and it shows uh, uh, a hippie type. You can see here, and it's what they're thinking as they're passing each other on the streets. And the hippie student is looking at this woman saying, decrepit old conservative anti-intellectual rich snob aging bag. Okay. <laughs> and she is saying, ruffy and scruffy long-haired college punk, what's this generation coming to? <laughs> so uh, anyway, that was the perception was the of some students. <laughs> what was the date on that? Uh, nine, uh, December 11th, 1970. Thank you. Was it <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I think our experiences 
reflect not only our differences, but the extreme complexity of the community. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the most diverse and heterogeneous communities I've ever lived in, and it's astonishing because it is so small. Uh, we had a son who couldn't manage the public school, so he was at the Hampton Day School. We got to know people through the Hampton Day School. Other people got pushed in other directions according to their interests and context. And so you became a trustee of the Parish Art Museum. Yeah, and the day school. And, and the day school. both my wife and I were president of the day school board for a while. We were led in different directions. Yes, I understand. How we were fortunate in that we had three gregarious children. <laughs> and equally gregarious dog and cat. <laughs> and we got to know the community very rapidly. And then uh, Mary uh, helped organize a nursery school and the Southampton Nursery School. And they were in everything. That's right. yeah, well, the really kids are such a help when it comes to getting to know people in the community, aren't they? I mean, young, youngish kids, of course, they have to be at least under, you know, 10 or something. Otherwise, <laughs> you will not get to know their kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, Harry. While all these guys were marching and doing things, I was trying to run the car. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was a severe drug problem on the campus, without question. And there's an organization called the Seventh Squad out of Suffolk County that, that really enjoyed coming up to the campus and acting like students, but they weren't students, they were detectives. There were several very difficult situations. One that I remember distinctly was a young man was taking final exams and the, his house, his rent had expired and there was an exam that was still to be taken after he had to get out of the place. So he lived bunked in with some other people and was sleeping on the couch when the 7th Squad came in and uh, busted him and busted him with other people. They had safe houses on this, on, in the area of Shinnecock Hills. I finally found out where they were and delighted in waking them up in the middle of the night by getting their phone number because they were very, very oppressive police. We finally worked out an arrangement in McCarthy's when they picked up the tab uh, for lunch to, to decide how we were going to run these things. And they would stay off campus until uh, we had agreed that they could come on. I, I didn't want them on by themselves. Well, the very next day I went to bed that night about 10 o'clock and got a phone call from the dean of students, Danny Alvino, I believe it was, and the, the seventh squad was all over the campus. So I mean, these were tough times, yeah. very difficult times. Now the drug situation went away, uh, I mean, it diminished. I'm not naive to think that it went away completely, but we were able, the seventh squad was the most difficult police organization I've ever dealt with, yeah. no matter where I was. Yes, there was an issue there in t also in terms of the community, I think, mm -hmm. because I think that uh, the local community thought that the college had been the conduit for drugs into the local community. Mm -hmm. um, I think the drugs would have gotten here whether yeah. the college was here or not, but nevertheless that was another kind of chilling experience yeah. on it. But I was thinking of Betty Skinner and Jane Stelwage and and Reverend Howard Velsey of the Methodist Church uh, getting together and forming the Alternatives Counseling Center about that time mm -hmm. in order to really deal with issues of drug abuse mm -hmm. um, on campus and in the community. Mm -hmm. Gee, I didn't realize that Alternatives had been around for that Since long Since 1970. Time. That's great. As you say, it really was the times, wasn't it? I mean, if you looked at any college campus, it probably would have been the same. But was there at all a sense of, oh my gosh, we look bad in town? I mean, was there... Any Very much the thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> the college has matured in a very gracious way, yeah. and I think it's fine. Now, Ralph, you were environmentally active, right? Well, not in that sense. You were not marching? <laughs> I was not an activist. Okay. But you were active in getting your students yeah. involved in local issues, is that correct? Yeah. I mean, did they attend meetings and try to make changes in local laws and things like that? Well, they, a few meetings, but uh, they got into every possible activity mm -hmm. they could, uh, from beach grass planting mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. uh, well, they were just everywhere. Well, um, let's just talk for a moment about the, the marine biology, the marine science program. I mean, it just seems that from very, very early on, that's been such a 
wonderful, well-known, respected program in this university. When, when we first got here from the West Coast, maybe it was uh, jet lag or Ford lag. We had a Ford wagon. <laughs> <laughs> but I drove right by the Marine Station. I didn't know that, that was the Marine right. Station. And the science building was brand new, just open, sort of. And uh, it, was, it was a diverse community. The bookstore was in the basement. The gym was in the basement. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it, and a, it was a great building. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was handed the keys to the gymnasium by Art Hall and told that we owed $875,000 on the gym. And I went to see people and talk about it. They said, there's no money. So I made arrangements to pay the interest on the debt for the entire time that I was here but never got beyond that. There was, not the, there was an inadequate sense, sense of planning on the part of the university. They put up these early Howard Johnson buildings all over the campus with, with no planning for where, what was to go where. And we were very fortunate that we've now got a president, David Steinberg, who pays attention to us in a positive way. And I think uh, at the beginning it was very tough. Then the other thing that was supposed, I was supposed to do, I was told emphatically, that I had to build a sewage treatment plant. Uh, oh. and, and We're still that waiting. Was, that was in 1972. There still is no sewage treatment plant. <laughs> and I'm sorry about that, but that's one of those things. Um, one of the things that I thought was so cute when I read a little bit of the history of the college was, I mean, it was so hard to remember, but the dress codes that were in effect <laughs> in the very early years. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, no skirts. I mean, skirts only at dinner. Mm -hmm and no sneakers, no shorts, uh, so forth. Was it that, uh, that was on the other campuses. Was there a dress code here there as was, well? There was, but I think the really interesting part of it was Queen Anne Lounge was where all the women students were, and there was a um, head mother uh, right. uh, yes. who lived in, in the Queen Anne Lounge, I guess, and then all of the uh, women lived in the Montauk uh, dormitory areas, and there was curfew, 11 mm -hmm. o'clock, 12 o'clock, and 1 o'clock. And uh, you got demerits if you were late coming in, mm -hmm. and too many demerits, and you couldn't go out. And obviously, the, the person who was penalized was the woman student, not the male student, under those circumstances. There used to be tremendous traffic jams in the circle, trying to get everybody <laughs> in at the same time. There was also a rule that you had to keep your door open with the width of a book, uh, oh. so that oh. anybody coming by could, I Check guess, have the opportunity activities. to see what was going on there. Uh, and all of that changed within a year. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Long Island University tried to adapt the, some of the trappings of the, some of the finer liberal arts colleges in New England. But Dr. Glantz has been at Bates, and <coughs> I think a lot of that had to do with the attempt by LIU to, to emulate those, those, pro, those programs. Well, I guess a lot of schools had those trappings. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, you know, and, and the faculty was involved to some extent, because when I came here, I was one of the few that refused to wear ties. <laughs> and uh, what was interesting was uh, uh, by, uh, I don't know, four or five years, uh, Don Baker, to make himself stand out, wore a tie because no one else right. was. <laughs> so, you know, we had to reverse those, those roles. Right. Yeah. How quickly and how radically things changed, didn't they? I mean, they were pretty much just but, the opposite. But I so think this was national as well. Yes. Oh, oh, yeah, I, I, <coughs> Kent State was a, a right. deeply yeah. troubling yeah. experience, and the students just stopped going to classes, and the faculty had to deal with that. And that happened all over the country. So the, would you say that the kids were pretty aware then and tuned into the national political scene? Oh, indeed. I think in terms of, of activism, though, the, the national pattern was that on any given campus, there were probably about 10% who were out there uh, uh, demonstrating. But if you've got a thousand students, that means a hundred are out there and everybody looks around <laughs> and, and thinks that uh, there's much more to it maybe than there was. On the other hand, it's fair to say that uh, although there were only 10% out there, there were at least another 50 Five percent who supported what they were doing but didn't want to go out there themselves. The windmill, uh, the polls the windmill did uh, indicated that uh, there was that uh, sense of radicalism, but uh, 
One of the, uh, I don't have it here, but uh, they did a survey of who would you uh, vote for president, and Ed McCarthy, and, and they also had Fred Halstead, who was the socialist, and, uh, and then the, the regular candidates and so forth, uh, uh, coming on down from there, Nixon, Kennedy, and so forth. And uh, almost nobody supported the socialists. But McCarthy got a lot of votes. So their radicalism was sort of amorphous in the, in the middle. Yeah. What was encouraging, if I may, was I think the growing tolerance of uh, variability, of varieties. Uh, I was always rather staid, but it was rather nice going to a commencement, <laughs> knowing that I could count on at least one young man graduating in nothing but his gown. <laughs> and the acceptance of a more very behavior seemed to be a yes. positive. Thing. Captain yes. Midnight gowns and all kinds of stuff. That I also think that the political yeah. activism really began in 1968, because that's when Bill yeah. Burr ran for uh, the Democratic nomination yes. for Congress, and now his son-in-law is our congressman. Right. So, uh, was he was his candidacy, you know, really talked about, and were people excited about that? Otis Pike, was, Otis Pike was, I don't know about the college, uh, but I could speak for Otis Pike who said that uh, Bill Burke was the toughest candidate he faced because he was the smartest. Mm -hmm. And Bill, it was a serious, he was a serious candidate. Mm -hmm. he, he lacked a lot of money, I think, but he, he was serious. In so many schools at that time, there was a great deal of conflict between students and administration. Was that the case at all here, storming the administration building or anything like that? Well, there was there was uh, looking at the student windmills. Harry found more because he was might have been a target of some of this. But uh, uh, there there uh, before Harry came, I was looking mainly at the windmills during the the, the glands era. And uh, one of the first real uh, uh, series of demonstrations had to do with tuition increase. Mm -hmm. And the students protested this, and uh, some of the faculty also protested it. And they, I remember at one point I was mentioning to somebody here, the, uh, one of the students made a proposal because there was a lot of antagonism about the way uh, Ed Glantz really got caught in the middle of this. And he really was sort of a, a well-intended person, but, but uh, somewhat out of touch. The six he just caught him without really... Uh, As it caught uh, many people. Uh, yes. <laughs> and he didn't really know how to react to what was going on. And uh, so he kept saying the wrong thing, and even though he was well-intended. And at one point, one of the students said, okay, okay, we don't want this tuition, but we'll make a deal. We'll accept a uh, increase in tuition if you'll fire Ed Glantz. <laughs> and I remember the outrage response by the dean, how could you speak like this, or whatever. whatever. But yeah, there was, there was, that was the, uh, the thing internally. Now, maybe uh, Harry can speak to more about what happened during his regime, because that Things were maybe a little different then. You came in sixteen, with, uh, no, in, in seventy-two, right after. Uh, May I have just one minute? Yes. Sorry. Sorry. One of the more delightful adventures, which I was close to, was a group of students and a faculty member or two deciding that the speed bumps interfered <laughs> with their liberty of self-expression. And one afternoon, we proceeded to try to burn two or three of them down. The whole idea of burning down speed bumps. <laughs> 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 You were always student threatened to lay in the 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 the in 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 the first chapter of the SDS was formed at Southampton College. Oh, right. We met in the basement of Shelter Island Dormitory. I remember going down, um, I guess I was about 27 then, and looked more like a student than a faculty member, and hadn't been there very long, um, and discovered there was much more smoke than there was fire. But uh, it was an of smoke? Has <laughs> <laughs> a fascinating process. And then I think the most serious demonstration occurred when we went into Cambodia. And uh, the president of the student body actually organized um, a rally which amounted to burning some of the furniture in the front gate of the college. And we actually closed they the college. piled the whole furniture. Right. Oh, is that we serious? actually closed the, closed the college as of May 1st. And uh, people got grades in terms of what they'd earned up to May 1st at that point. So? so that was the most serious. Uh, what year was that? 71. 71. 
70 or something. 70 or something. Let me just mention a quick one. You were always uptight. You couldn't ever let the students let you let them know that you were uptight. But come commencement weekend, I got to campus very early one day, and uh, the flag was at half mast. And I called the security and I said, what is going on? They said, well, we don't know. We'll find out. They, don't, they didn't call back for some time. I called the dean of students. What's going on? We'll find out. So then this young man came with his, with his maintenance uniform on, with his hat in his hand, said, Mr. President, he said, our instructions say that on Memorial Day weekend, the flag is at half Because <laughs> <laughs> I thought it had something to do with a great riot. <laughs> I was very relieved that that was <laughs> to be, you know, anybody in charge, like a parent or mm -hmm. an administrator or I suppose you all who were teachers probably, students seem to kind of feel an alliance with mm -hmm. professors, mm -hmm. I would say, more so, certainly than administrators at that time, right? <laughs> and you all were in your high tw 20s, right? Mm -hmm. High, <laughs> high 20s. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like the sound of it, but I... <laughs> and one of the things I translated into was uh, dissolving the student government and dissolving the faculty council and creating a student faculty council. Of, and that uh, happened? That happened. Yes. There were 50 members of, of the student body, 50 nice. members of the faculty, and then there was an executive committee of that. Yeah. Um, that lasted about a year and a half and students stopped going. Uh, but uh, it was indeed, a, an, uh, students right. wanted to have a right. say, wanted to participate. Uh, it was an interesting period. It, in the point. little history, it, it, there was a photo of the students and it said they had their own fire brigade at Southampton. Yes, they that did. Really <laughs> that must have been before the later 60s when they were having and, the dress code yeah, and so forth. The insurance, uh, fire insurance. Uh, benefited. Oh, really? Well, it was several serious fires, too. We lost the Scotch Mist Ends, right? Yes. Yeah. That, was in the, that was in the spring of 68, and it was right after Martin Luther King Jr.'s okay. uh, assassination. And I remember someone handing me a fire hose um, at, right, right outside of the Peconic dormitories, because the fire had gotten that close. And I thought to myself, oh, this is something I'd never been trained for. Uh, so I stood there with this fire hose until somebody took it away from me. But uh, it, was a, it was a scary period at that point. There were drawbacks, uh, too. The, the fire truck that was tied mm -hmm. That's right. was abandoned because of the, uh, this was not scotch mist, but a brush fire. And uh, the kids left it for a, few minutes because a fire had come across and all the tires were burned right <laughs> off the truck. Oh my gosh. I don't know if you can see, this is the, the dormitory and there's the fire from the Scotchman's Den. You can Ooh. see how uh, uh, most yeah. of them was trying to... Can you pass it around? Yeah. Yeah. That was 1968. But I must say, regardless of how the, some of the locals felt about the college during the war, we did have several close shaves with fires and the fire, the fire department always showed up. I argued strenuously to get a substation out here down by the reservation. We got that eventually in the mid-70s. They were, I mean, uh, volunteer firemen in this community are very important. And they've always been and continue to be. Um, I'm sorry, Chad, what was One of the other things that occurred, and this was, I'll just pass on also, this is one of the marches downtown. You can see how it might scared some people. One of the things that happened when Don hired me was that uh, he had gotten a grant to do education with Head Start programs. And so I became the outreach person, I suppose, driving from Long Beach to Greenport, uh, visiting with all of the students who were like um, assistant teachers who were going to college. Uh, and they would be coming out on weekends to take classes, as I remember. Um, and this led to a, a close relationship in Southampton. Mm -hmm. And um, we got together and, and uh, Jenny Spellman uh, mm -hmm. became the first African-American woman to run for the school board. And we opened a, uh, a Jenny Spellman for school board office on uh, mm -hmm. Main Street, about where the Aero Laundry is now. Um, we, we were met with some very interesting uh, reactions, but it was, I think, an important she, she kind She should have been a member of SCORE. <laughs> it, 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 it was an important kind of alliance that was made in terms of that, the African-American community. Um, how about the Shinnecock community, John? I mean, 
being that the college is sort of <coughs> on land that they presumably used to own and, or live in and occupy. Not, even, not presumably. <laughs> right, <it did. laughs> how, how, did, how did that relationship evolve? How did the Shittacocks feel, number one, about the, the coming of the college, and number two, about how you all interacted once it started? Well, it, it's, uh, it's been a somewhat troubled and somewhat ambivalent uh, relationship over the years. I think uh, early on, uh, they saw this as a potential for jobs, and many of them did start working here. And uh, then when uh, we started setting up tutorial programs on the, uh, in the community house on the reservation, they saw the possibility of getting some of their, their uh, children coming through the college. We set up uh, a Mandu scholarship, which gives a scholarship to any uh, child from the reservation who is uh, uh, living on the reservation and comes in the tuition manager's way. We still have that in, uh, in place. Uh, the Dartmouth scholarships are there? Dartmouth is there too, although we were not directly uh, part of that, but uh, they, they had that option. <coughs> yeah. uh, but in terms of other relationships, there were some troubled times. One of the problems was the, uh, uh, the uh, tavern that's right on the corner oh. of the reservation, and very often the students would go there and hang out, and some of the young people from the reservation would go there, and then this question would come up about, you know, that's our land, and then pushing and shoving and, uh, and so on. Uh, that that's, uh, uh, doesn't seem to be a, a, a problem anymore, but there were, there were times. Right. And uh, the college is in Shinnecock Hills, and Shinnecock Hills is an area that they feel was taken from them by fraud. Right. And so there's that kind of uh, mm -hmm. feeling. Princess uh, Owen Donna. Well, you had a relationship, did you not, with the... Uh, the oyster was it? Yeah. Yes, it was. Uh -huh. This was the uh, beginning of agriculture. Uh, and the several, now maybe six, of the uh, young men on, of the tribe had gone to uh, a school uh, near Seattle and had studied oyster culture there for oh, several weeks anyhow, and then they came back and uh, the federal government helped and then they came to us and we helped mm -hmm. too. And the, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know whether any of you have ever been down on, on the, uh, to the oyster culture uh, area on the reservation, but it really is grand. And it, for years it, it went very well, and then uh, one thing and another, uh, people took, uh, these were uh, tribal people, took other positions, and, and now it is just sort of spiraling <coughs> along. The aquarium at Riverhead uses it to store their fish, for example. <laughs> and, but it, it has changed. And there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a piece to pick up to that, because yeah. the young men who went out to Seattle to study actually went out as a result of Mona Dayton, who That's was right. another person that Don yeah. Baker yeah. hired. Mm -hmm. uh, and Mona was, I think, um, a very important person, not only in the college community, but in the broader community as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, she uh, was very instrumental in that process. I also thought the college came of age in 1998 when Fred Thiel, a graduate of Southampton College, uh, was running as an incumbent against Melissa Arch Walton, who was a student and a yes. Shinnecock. Right. Uh, it seemed to me that at right. that point we could say we had uh, right. served a real purpose. Right. <laughs> and I think it's yes. worth pointing out that the college provided employment for a number of full-time residents of the reservation, and still does, and some quite important people of one of the maintenance staff, Walter Wise, mm -hmm. was a beloved man who enjoyed his job. Is he, very, is he still there? Retired, right. but He's retired. Yeah. But people in all sorts of offices yeah. uh, all over the campus, so that uh, there was a certain kind of integration. Yeah. Yeah. And Princess O'Donna, who was uh, yeah. one of the tribal elders, got her teaching certificate at Southampton and went sure. on to teach in East Hampton, and she always complained bitterly about our use of the land, but she, she winked a few times and congratulated us for, for taking her on as a student and having her graduate. Mm -hmm. yeah. She's a nice person. Harriet, Harriet Combs. Harriet Combs. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
um, it seems that quite a few local people have worked there for a long time. It, it seems to really be a place that people have felt loyal to for many, many years as an employer. Right, because, I mean, I think there are a number of people in this room who have been there over 20 years and so forth. Which, it must be one of the largest employers in Southampton, is it? Yes, it is. And in the hospital, the hospital are the two largest. Are the two largest? And it's, a, it's an institution that has, in, has developed uh, a sense of caring amongst the people who work there. And there's a certain passion that people who are affiliated with that institution have for that institution. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's unique in that respect. Mm -hmm. And yes, before we finish, uh, maybe some people in the audience have questions. Okay? I, I, we'd love to have some questions. Let me just see if there's anything else that I wanted to. <coughs> I want to just ask a couple more things about your students. Um, how would I mean? I know the times are different. It's 30 years later, 35 years later. How would you compare the students back then? I mean, that's a good question. And to the students who go there today. Um, would any of you have any comments on that? They were better dressed. <laughs> <laughs> they had their only, only, their only up until the dress code. <laughs> <laughs> or is it just more or less the way people have changed between now and then every, everywhere? No, I think that our student body is probably better prepared in many respects. Uh, uh, in, in terms of commitment to college. There. I often thought of my early years at Southampton, like I'd been in the Peace Corps, like a Peace Corps experience in reverse. Here were kids who came from fairly wealthy families on Long Island who were really alienated from the learning process. Mm -hmm. And I saw my mission in, in terms of how do, you, how do you get these kids turned on to learning? How do you get them really excited about the learning process? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and today, many of our students come prepared to study, I think. I remember when I first came, there were a number of students who were fairly wealthy. And I found myself chagrined one day when a young man said he couldn't buy a Shakespeare book because he had to buy a battery, a new battery for his Cadillac. Uh, <laughs> that sort of student, I think, hardly exists now. The students seem to me much more mature in their approach to their classes and themselves and their education. Mm -hmm. they, they seem older at their age, I think, than the students in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that I... I think I observe that in, in kids in general, though. I'm really surprised at how much more, more mature they seem than, than the people who were going to college in the 60s and 70s, 30 years ago. I, that's my own feeling, but I don't know. There is a change, though. In, I think that m many of our students come to school with an automobile that they're paying for, mm -hmm. automobile insurance that they're paying for, and credit card debts. Now, in the 60s, students didn't have credit card debts, and uh, they weren't as involved in working mm -hmm. to make sure that they could pay their own way, and, right. they, and also college is much more expensive today, and to uh, keep paying for That's that. True. So uh, many of our students work probably 15, 20 hours a week, uh, which is pushing it in terms of being a full-time mm -hmm. student as well. I think there's more of a focus on uh, careerism and professionalism than there was before. This is something that came, I guess, as a result of a, a lot of problems in, in, in the outside world. But the parents uh, from the 70s on were always wanting to know when they had these parent meetings, you know, well, how is this going to get my kid a job? Which is not necessarily a, 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 a positive thing, I think, in many ways, but there's a much more of a, of a sense on, there has been, I don't know if that's changing, as we move into these changes to college, we're kind of hoping that it is going to change, that the students are going to become more interested in, in the broader concerns of the liberal arts. Well, I read an article about a week ago saying that we've sort of come back to the stage at which kids who are going to college now really wonder if they will be able to do as well as their parents have done. So, I mean, it's sort of changing with the economy, don't well, you think? Well, a part so? of it, I think, has to do with the nature of our higher education, too, because uh, back in the, in the 60s, uh, you got your BA and you went out into the world. And so the BA was, was very important in terms of that, in terms of the job and the entry-level job and so forth. But uh, by the mid-1980s and 90s, uh, if you didn't have a master's, uh, you know, the pressure was off the BA so much, you know, you do that when you, you leave here. And so the professionalism, I think maybe that may be one thing that's changing a, a little bit. I don't know. Have your students from the 60s 
and 70s kept in touch with you, any of them? Do, do you yeah, know what they're doing? Oh, yes. That must uh, be gratifying, I hope. Did. It is. It is. I hope they're doing good things. There are a number who are quite successful. Mm -hmm. uh, in art, for example, John McQueen graduated at that time, and everybody knows that he's an eminent artist. Mm -hmm. There were people in English who went on to PhDs and into teaching careers, and others who are writers. Mm -hmm. Danny Judson, well, he's a little later, and he didn't graduate, but he's just published two mystery <laughs> books uh, set in Southampton, The Bone Orchard right. and The Poison Rose, and they both have something to say about Southampton society. We can't forget Could the Fulbrights. No, yes. Tom, Tom dazzles me with his memory. Tom Hairshine, division. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that in part two of this, we'll have Don Baker and Tom Hairshine. I hope, I hope you'll come back and hear them too. I, yeah. I want to jog my husband's memory. Uh, the reunion we went to recently, uh, one of the first classes uh, from Southampton, and what some of those students said about their experience, because I think it was Interesting. Yeah, Earth Chuck was there also, yeah, and they, uh, uh, one after another came up, and there were some, many of them, of course, that I didn't remember, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they, uh, uh, they were quite positive, and it sort of, uh, I was taken aback a little bit by uh, their uh, enthusiasm about their years at, uh, at Southampton. That's good to hear. They were classes of, oh, uh, 67, 68, mm -hmm. 69, 69. And I recently received a letter from uh, Gil Rana, who some of you may remember the Rana store in yep. Bridgehampton. Mm -hmm. That's right. And he's now a chiropractor in suburban Chicago right. and uh, was very concerned about the college and set a nice contribution as well. Right. Now, Ral, you've got all those Fulbright scholars. Yes. Yes. I hope they're keeping in touch with you. Or some of them. Some of them. <laughs> But that's the, so impressive. Th this is why I defer to Tom Hairsign, who has been just wonderful about keeping an alumni uh, bulletin going and ke keeping in touch with me. Tom, tell them about the division. <laughs> <laughs> that's about that student, I need <laughs> <laughs> uh, Now, we, we really do hear from a lot of alumni. Right. There are, uh, somewhere around 100, you know, 125, 150 graduates of the science degree who now teach in university. Wow. Uh, a very large, respectable yes. number. And uh, we hear from them, and we hear from others who are employed. Uh, those who are not employed in the science field, we don't hear from them. <laughs> I think they're actually a few. <coughs> yes, yeah, but we have, we have, we have, we have uh, uh, Fred Thiel, we've got Tom DeMayo, we've got judges, and, yeah. uh, and so forth. But, uh, some of, the, of my favorites are uh, history majors. Uh, one of them is uh, 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 it's now a ceramicist. He makes pots over in, in uh, uh, Bridgehampton. And the other, uh, Doug Dwyer, is a uh, part-time musician. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure what that says about our history. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> we have several graduates that own their own businesses in town. Uh, in it's town. right in town. Right. The driver's seat is owned by graduates of Southampton College. The one up Barristers. on Barristers is owned by a young man who graduated from the college. They may have stayed in the area even though they had not planned when they came here. Yeah. I think that's one of the remarkable things is, is the number of, of people who have come to Southampton College and stayed in the community. Oh yes, many of them. Uh, I think that's an unusual aspect of, of having come to Southampton, or having come to college and, and stayed. Mm -hmm. Rich Warren, one of our graduates, has his own oh, environmental right. agency, that's and, right. and there are several of our graduates working that's for him. Right. Right. We're, we're just about finished with the taped portion of this event, so before we actually run out of time on that, I, I want to say that we're going to have some questions, uh, a few more questions, but before we end, I would like to thank each of you very, very much for being a guest here tonight, and uh, it's been a very long time. Well, okay. Um, I have to say that now that we've done it, I can see how very inadequate one hour is with five, these, you know, with these five great people because there are so many more. And I, I'd like to sort of continue this oral history theme of the college at, at a later date if some of uh, some of the rest of you would like to participate. 
But I, I, also, I also just wanted, I mean, it seems to me from what you've all said that you have really enjoyed teaching at the college. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you've made it your lives, really, just about That's all right. of you, haven't you? And one of my fond memories was playing tennis with your father. So. I, I know you said that. I, my father was such a big champion of the college and one of the people who was very <coughs> much wanting it to happen and then Absolutely. was pretty connected once it did happen. So that was good memory. Of course, we were girls in high school. We were just thrilled that the college was coming. <laughs> we thought it would increase the pool of eligible boyfriends. So, and we, you know, we did get to know some of those people. And, 